All right, class, welcome to Chapter 2, Land Redundancy. We're going to talk about spanning tree. We're going to talk about some of the varieties of spanning tree, how to configure spanning tree, and then we're going to talk about first hop redundancy protocols. Now, first hop redundancy protocols are not a CCNA topic, um, but they introduce them here in CCNA, and that way when you get introduced, when you see them again in CCNP, um, you're not a stranger to them. And then we'll summarize everything. All right, spanning tree concepts. Now, your typical network in a perfect world looks something like this. You have a core layer, a distribution layer, and an access layer. You've got layer three switches at the core and the distribution, and everything interconnects to everything so that if one line goes down anywhere, um, the, the network is still operational. So that's what we mean by redundant. You know, we can lose a link or two and we can still function. You know, the, people can still get their job done. But the problem with redundant links, especially when we're talking about these access layer switches, if we don't have layer three switches, are what happens when a broadcast comes into a switch um, and he doesn't know where it goes? Well, obviously the switch isn't going to know because he's not going to have you know all Fs in his uh, Mac cam. So then he's going to broadcast out to the other switches. Well, if you don't have any layer three switches, then all the switches are going to receive the broadcast they're not going to know where it goes, so then they're going to send it out. So it creates switching loops. So um, you have these giant loops in your switching network. Now obviously the layer 3 switches kill the broadcast, uh, but how many people can afford a network like this? Alright, so multi-cabled paths, or re the redundant connections, you know, um, provide physical redundancy in the switch network. You know, if one goes down, you know you're still covered. Um, it, imp it improves the reliability and the availability of the network. You know, several lines have to go down before your network is unavailable. Um, and it enables users to keep accessing their resources, you know, even when there is a disruption of a, a cable or something like that. All right, but some things to think about when you're planning your redundancy. Um, MAC database instability, meaning, um, remember, we write the MAC down from the source, so if, if my PC sends a broadcast and it hits the switch, the switch is going to record that, but then he doesn't know where it is, so he's going to broadcast it out. So other switches may also learn my MAC address from different port numbers. Um, so that could cause an issue. Broadcast storms. Remember, at layer two, there's no MAC, there's no time to live. Meaning, you know, once a broadcast hits a switch and then hits another switch and it kind of starts in this circular motion, the loop, there's nothing to kill it. There is no time to live like there is on the layer three packets, where after a certain amount of time it'll just die on its own. So these broadcast storms can propagate forever unless a user intervenes. And then your last consideration is multiple frame transmission, meaning my unicast packet, because of the loop, may actually arrive twice to the same destination. And a lot of protocols out there don't know what to do when they receive a duplicate packet. Um, you know, if I got two number fives, well, what do I do with that? So just some things to think about. All right, remember, at layer two, we don't have any time to live. So if our switching network looks like this, you know, when this PC sends a broadcast, it hits this switch, and then this switch broadcasts it to the other switch, and then he can broadcast it to this switch. And then you can see how just with these four switches, there's a possibility for three different loops to be created. And again, in layer two switching, there's no mechanism to kill those um, loops. Well, not to kill the loops, but to kill the traffic. So once a loop starts, it'll go forever. So that's where spanning tree comes in. Spanning tree st stops the loops. So it stops the loops from being created. And then if a link goes down, it'll open up a link. So it kills extra links uh, so that they're not used, so that there are no loops that are created. And then if for some reason the primary goes down, it opens those back up to use as your backup paths. All right, so like I said, um, Ethernet frames, your layer two, don't have a TTL attribute. And remember, the TTL attribute is a layer three device, and as packets hit the router, the router takes the TTL down by one. So eventually, once the TTL is zero, the, the router will drop the packet. So again, the frames will continuously go through the loop, um, results in all kinds of MAC database instability, um, just there's all kinds of issues with that. So obviously it's going to involve user interaction. You're going to have to go in there and fix it. Do you have to turn a switch off? Do you have to unplug a link? Um, is the, is the, the MAC database table getting hammered? Uh, that kind of stuff. All right, so again, broadcast storm. You know, anytime a PC sends a broadcast, um, it, as long as there's a loop in the network, 
it can create a broadcast storm. If you have a faulty NIC card, it can go just start broadcast, 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 doing some crazy stuff. Um, and again, if you've got a loop in your network, it'll go forever. So we can use, uh, some bad guys obviously use that as a form of a denial of service attack to just keep broadcasting into your network um, so that your network gets bogged down with that. Uh, but a faulty NIC, NIC card could cause that as well. All right, here's a little, uh, a couple of screenshots, well, a couple of pictures, um, showing you kind of like how the broadcast happens or the broadcast storm. So PC4 you know, forwards out a broadcast uh, that gets caught in loop. So when that broadcast hits this switch, um, he forwards it to this switch, and then he forwards it to this switch. Because remember, the switch has no idea where the broadcast destination is, so he forwards it out all the other ports. So then this switch gets it, and this switch gets it. When this switch gets it, he doesn't know what to do with it, so he forwards it out all ports. And he also forwards it out this port. Now, when this switch got his, he forwarded his out this port. So this switch gets it again, then he forwards it out here, then he forwards it back to here. So you can see this endless cycle, and these PCs are going to get crushed because every time this switch receives the broadcast, he's going to forward it back out. So not only do we have to worry about broadcasts, but even our unicast frames can actually get stuck in the loop and get delivered multiple times. And as we discussed earlier, um, not all protocols know what to do or have a mechanism in place to handle a duplicate packet. You know, when I receive packet five three times, what do I do with that? So in this example, PC1 is sending to PC4. So when PC1 sends to S2, S2 has no idea where PC4 is because PC4 is not directly connected. So he does not have the MAC address for PC4 in his CAM. So then he forwards it out to S3 and S1. Now, if for some reason S3 knows where PC4 is and S1 knows where PC4 is because he's directly connected and this guy received a broadcast from him earlier so he has a port number for him, S3 will send it to S1 and S1 will send his original one to S4. I'm sorry, to PC4. So when this guy sends out to 3 and 1, when 3 gets it for step 2, he'll send it to 1, but 1 sends his to PC4. And then he'll get this one, and then he'll send that one. So PC4 will get this unicast frame two times. So again, not all protocols know what to do with that, and we can cause crashes and all kinds of other weird um, activity on our PCs. So in a nutshell, um, switching loops are bad. <laughs> you know, we want redundant connections. Um, we want uh, load balancing where possible, um, but we don't want switching loops because they cause all kinds of issues. All right, so enter spanning tree. A spanning tree goes through, and what happens is one switch is, ma is um, designated the, uh, the root bridge or the master. And then the decision is made from the master, what's the fastest way to get to all the other networks? And then all extra paths are shut down. And that way there are no loops. So again, with spanning tree, you kind of have to be careful which one becomes what they call the root bridge. I like to call it the master, but the technical name is the root bridge. So how does spanning tree do this? Remember, on Cisco switches, spanning tree is enabled by default. So as soon as you plug a switch into the network, um, he starts sending out BPDUs, bridge protocol data units. And then he starts advertising his information. Hey, my priority is this, and my MAC address is this. And then all the other switches receive that information, and then they decide, oh, hey, is this new switch going to be the master or somebody else? And we'll talk about you know, how the master gets elected in just a little bit. But these BPDUs are sent out from all switches all the time. And then the BPDUs decide who's going to be the master and which um, uh, links are going to get shut down. Now, these links aren't shut down. They're just deactivated for data. They still receive BPDUs. Um, and that way they're, they're, they're listening for the BPDUs to see when they need to reactivate, um, but they're not passing data, um, and that way it won't create any extra loops. So the physical path will still exist, it's just that your switch will deactivate that one and only listen for a BPDU to tell him whether when he needs to activate that back up, if that makes any sense. So anytime a switch fails or a new switch comes online or something like that, spanning tree recalculates the paths. Um, it might decide a new master because the old one, you know, the old root bridge um, deactivated, 
or because new paths were introduced, BPDUs will go out and let everybody know, so then they'll recalculate the paths. So it's a constant process. Now, if you're running Wireshark on your PC, um, you'll see these spanning tree messages pop up all the time from the switches. So remember, even when you're not doing anything, like let's say you're sitting in class, remember there, there's like 24 chairs in the class, um, each class is its own network, so each class connects to a switch, and then that switch connects to a router. You're going to see broadcasts from um, OSPF, you're going to see broadcasts from Spanning Tree Protocol, you're going to see broadcasts from the printers, you're going to see broadcasts from the other protocols like DHCP, things like that. So even not doing anything, your PC is going to receive a lot of broadcasts. So just be aware, just because you're not doing anything on your PC does not mean your PC is not hearing or seeing other traffic out there, even though he's not doing anything. All right, so remember the root bridge, that's like the master. So basically the root bridge is elected and then everything is decided from his point of view. You know, what's the best path to network one? What's the best path to network two? Okay, all other paths are gonna be blocked um, to prevent loops. Now don't forget, the block paths um, are still receiving BPDUs from the other switches. And that way, if a primary path goes down, Spanning Tree knows which block path to turn on um, to make that path you know, come back online. Uh, and it all happens kind of in the blink of an eye, so it's kind of neat. Um, but just because the path is blocked does not mean it's disabled. If you disable a port manually, that port is disabled and nothing's going on, um, it no longer participates in Spanning Tree. But if you let Spanning Tree deactivate the port, then that port will still listen to BP to use and come up when it needs to come up. So there's a difference between a blocked port and a disabled port. You know, if you physically disable a port, that port's dead. If Spanning Tree blocks a port, the port is still listening to, for BP to use. Uh, he just not he just does not allow any traffic to be sent on that line. All right, if for some reason you have a hard time understanding this or, or you're, I'm, I'm losing you somewhere, make sure you bring this up in class. So basically, there's a root bridge that gets elected. Um, there can be a secondary root bridge as a backup. And then all the other switches out there um, are out there. All right, so what does spanning tree look like? If you go here, so what happened was, these three switches all turned on, spanning tree activated, and spanning tree disabled this link. So in this case, let's say that S1 becomes the, the root bridge. So from S1's point of view, the fastest way to get to PC4's network is through this line. The fastest way to get to S3's network, which theoretically would be over here, would be through this line. And then the fastest way to get to all these three networks would be to go straight down to S2. Because obviously it would take longer to go to S3 and then S2 to get down here. So spanning tree says, hey, S2, you need to deactivate this link here and put it in the blocking state. And that way there, there is no loop, continuous loop, because this line is broken. Now remember, don't forget, I, I talk about, oh, it's broken, but it's just placed in the blocking state, and it's still listening for BPDUs, um, so he knows when to come back up. And that way, if something were to happen, like this link here would die, Spanning Tree would then send a message to bring this one back up, and then you, we would just reroute the data. And again, all this happens invisibly in the blink of an eye. All right, then they got a couple slides. So again, you know, um, from here, the packet goes there. If I'm going to another network, it goes there. And then obviously, this is where it gets blocked because this port would be blocked. So S2 blocks the frame from coming in um, because he blocked that port. All right, port roles. You have to understand the port roles. So whatever switch becomes the root bridge, his ports, now any port that connects to the root bridge are root ports. So this port here on S3, um, F01, which connects to the root bridge is a root port. This port here, FA, or yeah, FA01 on S2, has a root port because it goes to the root bridge. So any switch that is not the root bridge that has a port that connects to the root bridge is called the root port. Any line that's left up because it's the best path to a network becomes a designated port and any port that is placed in the blocking state now becomes a non-designated port. So make sure you know the difference between a root port a designated port and a non-designated port. Obviously the non-designated ones are easy, they're the ports that are placed in the blocking state. Designated ports go to other networks. 
root ports point to the root bridge? All right, and that question always rears its ugly head. They show you some schematic like this, and they say, hey, S1 is the root port or the root bridge, and they say, hey, what would you call this link here on S3 um, that points to the root bridge? And then the, obviously the answer would be root port. All right, so how does the root bridge get elected? Well, what happens is the root bridge creates a, a root or a bridge ID packet, and it has three different fields. The first field is a priority field, and the lowest priority wins. So that's what they always look at first. So each switch sends out a bridge ID packet. And the very first thing they look at is the priority. Whoever has the lowest priority wins. Now the default priority is 32768. The range of priorities is from 0 to 61440. And if you're going to adjust the range, you have to adjust the range in increments of 4095, sorry. Now, whoever came up with all that, I have no idea. Why they gotta make it so hard? They just did. So make sure you know that the default priority is 32768 and the lowest priority wins. Now, if for some reason all, all switches have the same priority because nobody has changed them, they'll all have the same default priority. So if they're the same, um, there's a second field which really has information about the VLAN stuff. Um, that's used when we talk about per VLAN um, spanning tree and some other things. So as far as the CCNA goes, the second thing it looks at is the lowest hexadecimal MAC address that is used. So if all switches have the same priority, it looks for the lowest MAC address. And then so that's where that converting the hexadecimal comes into play. And remember, you got to start at the very first number. So if my hexadecimal address or my MAC address starts at zero and yours starts at one, already you know that mine's lower because mine's one. It will never, ever, ever be that easy on the CCNA. They'll always give you big long MAC addresses, and it won't be until like the eighth digit that you actually see something different. And everything will be the same until the eighth digit. Then one will be A and one will be C. And then you'll have to know, well, oh, well, A is lower than C because A is 10 and C is 12. Um, so that would be the MAC address used. So lowest bridge priority, lowest bridge priority, followed by lowest MAC address. All right, so again, that's the, the, the bridge ID tag. And again, it's just a tag with three different fields, the bridge priority, um, some information about the VUA number, and then the, the lowest hexadecimal MAC address. Um, that that switch has. And all those go out and then all the switches look and say, oh well, everybody's bridge priority is the same. Who's got the lowest MAC address? So and there's, they're looking at these packets and they're, oh okay, he's got the lowest MAC address, he becomes the root bridge. So make sure that you're fine with this election process. Because what can happen is, what happens if I buy a switch on eBay and somebody has set the bridge priority um, to one? Well, and then if I plug that switch into my network, it's going to send out these bridge IDs and then all the other switches are going to like bow down to him and say oh you're the winner you're the you're the new root bridge and and it's probably going to be some crappy um access switch that I have on there and it's not going to be one that I want to be the the root bridge so remember obviously you want your root bridge to be a more robust switch as if possible and you want it placed typically centrally located um so we can have the best path to all the other networks so anytime you bring a new switch into the chain, into your network, you need to make sure that you have looked at the bridge priority um, so that, and again, you can set it up higher so he never becomes the root bridge and things like that. There's also a way that you can force one switch to always be the, the primary and one switch to always be the secondary. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But don't forget, the root bridge dictates how the paths are going to go. They're all done from his point of view, and then loops are shut off from his point of view, which, which links are redundant. All right, so again, here's the bridge ID packet. So you can see um, this guy's bridge ID, his priority is 24, his MAC address is blah, 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 blah. His bridge ID is 32, his bridge ID is 32. So because he has the lowest bridge ID, or the, the lowest priority, S1 becomes the root bridge. Now, without that, who would become the root bridge? Let's say all their priorities were the same. Well, again, 000A002, 000A003, 00A, or 000A001. So this one, S2, would become the root bridge if all priorities were the same because he has the lowest MAC address. So again, you can see here, here's what the, um, 
the bridge ID uh, looks like. You've got the priority, you've got this extended system ID, which really is like the VLAN information, uh, and then you have the MAC address. So as far as CCNA goes for spanning tree protocol, the root bridge is elected first by bridge priority and second by lowest MAC address. Your book is kind of unclear about this, but this extended system ID, there's also a version of spanning tree where you can have an instance of spanning tree for every VLAN. And that way for VLAN 5, you know, S3 might be the root bridge. But for VLAN 10, S2 might be the root bridge. So that's where this extended system ID and the VLAN information comes into play. But for regular spanning tree, which is what is tested on the CCNA, lowest bridge priority followed by lowest MAC address. I can't say it any more clear than that. All right, so again, if you got any questions on that issue, bring them up in class. All right, so path cost. So what Spanning Tree does is from the root bridge, he decides how much he puts a cost on each path to get somewhere. And the cost is based on the speed of the link. So down here, you know, 10 gigabit has a cost of 2, 1 gigabit has a cost of 4, 100 megabits has a cost of 19, and then 10 megabits has a cost of 100. So then he'll add up, okay, to get to this network here, you know, I got this link here, and then I got this link here. So he'll add up the cost of both of those, and then he'll write that down. Then he'll add up the cost to go from here to here to here, and then whichever one has the lowest cost, that's going to be the link he uses. Now, obviously, all things being equal here, he's going to go from to S2 to PC1, and that's going to be his primary one because it's going to have the lowest cost. So just like OSPF, spanning tree works very similar. You know, it creates a master, uh, and then it, it, it judges everything from the master's point of view, and assigns a cost, and then it uses the lowest cost path to get to the destinations. All right, now... Once the election happens and everything's in place, remember with OSPF, a new election doesn't happen for the designated router unless the designated router goes down or spanning or OSPF is removed from the router. But for spanning tree, those elections can happen at any time because the BPDUs are always going out. Hey, anything changed? Hey, anything's changed? And that way, if you add a new switch, it can cause a new election. If you remove a switch, it can cause an election. If you change the, a priority number, the BPDU is going to be different, and then we can cause another election. So don't forget, OSPF only has elections really when you want them, uh, you know, when you take the, the uh, router down. With spanning tree, a lot of different things can trigger um, a, a new election and a new root bridge. So you have to be careful. So remember, BPDU is Bridge Protocol Data Unit, and it's something that Spanning Tree sends out from each switch, you know, with the bridge ID, you know, the cost, the priority, and the, the link cost. And that way, all switches know what the other switches are thinking, and then all switches kind of come up with the same idea. Hey, here's going to be the route, here's going to be the best path, that kind of stuff. And that way, again, they're all on the same sheet of music. All right, so again... Um, extended system ID, we kind of talked about this, about the priority and the uh, MAC address. Blah, same thing. All right, so Verizon spanning tree. All right, so again, you can see, whoo, looks like there's a lot. There's not actually a lot uh, of these. So obviously, uh, spanning tree, which is 802.1D. There's per VLAN spanning tree plus. Um, this IEEE standard that we probably will never use. Um, there's rapid spanning tree protocol, which Cisco does not support. And then there's rapid per VLAN spanning tree that Cisco does support. Then there's multiple, multiple spanning tree protocol. All right, so when you put them all together, remember, by default, your Cisco switches are all, you know, have spanning tree open. So your only real other option is rapid per VLAN spanning tree. Um, and again, that's a Cisco proprietary. Um, very, you need a lot of resources to run that because what it does is it turns on fast spanning tree where there's only three port states instead of five. And it has one for every VLAN. So if you've got 20 VLANs, you're going to have 20 instances of spanning tree going on. So there's 20 different calculations going on at all the time. All right, so again, per VLAN spanning tree plus... You know, this is an IEEE standard. Um, again, you've got a, a VLAN for every, or I'm sorry, you've got a spanning tree instance for every VLAN that you have on your network. So if you've got 12 VLANs, you've got 12 instances of spanning tree that all need to be calculated. All right, so again, 
this guy could be the root for VUN10, this guy could be the root for VUN20. So all that information then obviously is used, and then it, this guy blocks this port, this port will forward for VUN10, but it'll block for VUN20. And then over here, this port will forward for VUN20, but block for 10. So you can see how you get all these instances of spanning tree, all these different root bridges, and all these different rules for each port based on the VLAN. So don't forget, when you turn on this, the, any kind of per VLAN spanning tree, the more VLANs you have, the more processing power you need, and the slower uh, the router makes decisions, because he has to go through all these different rules that are now in place. All right, now your port states. Your normal port states for spanning tree protocol are blocking, and that's when the, the port is, is, the spanning tree says, hey, I want you to shut down, but I want you to receive BPDUs. At, notice, at no time in spanning tree are BPDUs blocked unless you disable a port. And remember, disabling is something the user does. You have to disable the port. Shut down. Boom, port's dead. So disabled is one state. Blocking is another. Blocking, I receive BPDUs, but I don't allow the data to forward. Disabled, everything's killed. All right, and then there's listening, learning, and forwarding. You know, listening. I'm listening to see information from BPDUs to see what's going on, um, who's going to be elected the root bridge, things like that. So when you first turn your, your switch on, he's in a listening state. And then after a while, he'll flip over to the learning state. And the only difference between these two is the learning state will learn MAC addresses from the sources that he gets. And then eventually he'll flip over to the forwarding state, and then he's forwarding data. So we're not forwarding data until we get to the forwarding state. So remember, when you turn your switch on, your ports are all amber. They're typically going from the listening to the learning, and then when they go green, then they're in the forwarding state. So I'm listening to see who's going to become the root bridge. Once that stuff is all done through spanning tree, then I go into the learning state, and I start learning MAC addresses. Um, I do that for a little bit, and then I go to green, and then I'm forwarding packets. And then spanning tree will decide which ones to block. And then if I have no reason for a port to be on, I will disable that. So make sure you're familiar with those five states. You know, when, you know, what state actually does not allow a BPDU to go across? When am I learning MAC addresses? So again, that stuff is pretty easy. All right, so with that extended system ID, remember we talked about um, the bridge ID and how it has the priority of the MAC address and then that extended system ID. So again, that comes into play when you're doing any kind of per VLAN spanning tree. Uh, and that way, you've got an ID for every different VLAN out there. And then you can make one specific switch the root for other for you know one VLAN. Then you can make another switch the root for another VLAN without having to do, like if I can, I can set the priority per VLAN. Does that make sense? So I can have a lower priority for VLAN 10 and then a higher priority for VLAN 20. And that can all be, and that's where that extended system comes into play. So I can have a different bridge ID with every VLAN. So that's where that comes into play. But as far as the CCNA goes, the root bridge is elected from the lowest priority and then followed by the lowest MAC address. So this is, comes into play for per VLAN spanning tree, but I've never seen a question that, that at, talked about that on the CCNA. So focus on this kind, this first. Um, and then you can learn about that stuff, or you can focus on that later. All right, so rapid per VLAN spanning tree. This is the preferred protocol, like if you're going to do something um, to prevent loops. Um, each rapid per VLAN spanning tree instance um, runs per VLAN, supports new port types and alternate port and discarding state. So it doesn't block ports anymore. It only has three states, discarding, learning, or forwarding. So because it only has three states, it comes up much faster. Instead of listening for the process and everything to happen, it goes right to the learning state. So your rapid per VLAN spanning tree can actually bring your ports up faster um, than your regular spanning tree. Now it does retain some backward compatibility, and it does have the same BPDU format um, as the regular spanning tree. All right, so what is um, rapid spanning tree protocol? Now, with this, remember, every port that goes to the root bridge is a root port. All right, then you got your designated ports to point to the other networks, and then instead of non-designated ports, now you have alternate ports or disabled ports. So it's a little bit different. 
Um, just make sure you know the difference between a root port and a designated port. Um, all ports on the root bridge are designated ports, and then all ports on other switches that point to the root bridge are root ports. And then redundant links um, become disabled. Now here's the beauty of the rapid per VUN spanning tree. With a fewer amount of ports, he also understands that if I don't receive a BPDU from a port, that that port is probably connected to an end user device or there's no other switch on that end. So he'll bring those ports up a lot faster. They'll immediately transition to forwarding and come up. So we turn that on with like um, on a Cisco switch you just do spanning tree space port fast on that port um, and then that'll put that into port fast mode. But with rapid per VLAN spanning tree you don't have to do that command. Um, it functions similarly by itself. So these ports here that are highlighted would all come up as soon as the switch is activated because they're like, hey, I have not received any BPDUs. Um, this must be an end user port and not another switch. Um, so I don't have to worry about this being a routing loop or some sort of switching loop. All right, more crap on link types. And hey, spanning tree configuration. About time we get some. All right, so remember, spanning tree protocol is enabled by default. Um, you know, as soon as you turn the switch on, BPDU start flowing and it goes out. Rapid spanning tree protocol is not supported by Cisco, and per VLAN spanning per VLAN spanning protocol is an old version that uses Cisco's old ISL um, that we're not currently using. So you're either going to use, excuse me, you're either going to use spanning tree protocol, the base model that comes on by default, or you're going to do rapid per VLAN spanning tree, and the command for that is spanning tree space mode space rapid dash pvst and that'll turn on rapid per vlan spanning tree so as far as the ccna goes those are your two flavors spanning tree and then rapid per vlan spanning tree remember the rapid part of the per vlan spanning tree means the ports come up faster if they're connected end users just like the port fast command um, and then the per vlan part of that means that there's one instance of spanning tree per vlan um, so we only recommend this for, uh, not for your little 2950 switches or something like that, especially if you've got like 50 VLANs. Oh my gosh, the switch would die. All right, so here's information on uh, like a Catalyst 2960 deep by default, you know, um, spanning tree mode. This says um, per VLAN spanning tree, so Rabla are disabled, but spanning tree is on. The default priority, um, the spanning tree port priority, um, the cost, you know, 1,000 megabits is 4, 100 megabits is, uh, is 19, that kind of stuff. All right, spanning tree timers. The hello time um, is every two seconds. So a BPDU every two seconds. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so every two seconds. And if I don't receive a BPDU after six seconds, um, then I'll place that, that link on hold. Alright, now remember we talked about setting the priority or setting it so that no matter what the priority is, you always have one that becomes the primary. And then here's the command. So spanning tree, VLAN 1, root primary. And then he will always be the root bridge. You can also set a secondary in case he goes down and you don't want like a new election process to happen where somebody else gets elected that you can't control. So you do spanning tree, VLAN 1, root secondary. So that would really be the preferred method to do that. You know, set the primary, set the secondary, and that way no matter what anybody else configures, you know, with, with priorities or what you plug in, those guys will always be the ones that you want, the primary and the secondary. Now, if you want to do it the other way, you can just do spanning tree, view in one, and then change the priority. Remember, we have to change the priority in multiples of 4096. So the lower the priority, um, the more chance of you getting elected as the root bridge. Alright, show spanning tree. If I do show spanning tree, it'll give me a whole bunch of information. Hey, here's what my priority is. And then if this is the root bridge, you'll see this bridge is the root. And then what his priority is. Um, the hello time, that kind of stuff. Um, what, what role the ports are in. These are designated ports. Remember, from the root bridge, all ports are designated ports. You're not going to shut a port off on the root bridge because the root bridge is the master deciding how to get everywhere. He, he's not going to have the slowest way to get somewhere. Obviously, some other switches. All right, port fast and BPDU guard. If you're just running spanning tree, 
and you want your ports on end user devices to come up faster, then we use the port fast command. So I go to the interface, interface fast ethernet 011, enter, and then spanning tree space port fast. And then you'll get the warning message, blah, 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 blah. But again, if it's going to an end user, you want that port to come up as fast as possible, especially if it's a voice over IP port. You know, if that port goes to a phone, your phone, when he receives power through, let's say it's a power over Ethernet link, and the phone comes up, you know, when the link comes up, he's going to automatically start searching for his files. Well, if the switch, if that switch port is going through, you know, the five steps of uh, spanning tree protocol, he may ask and then never receive a reply and then decide he's just going to go dead. So typically, with, especially with voice over IP phones, but any, any end user port should be put in the port fast mode. Now, you need to pair that up with BPDU guard. What BPDU guard does is it says, hey, if this is a, a port fast, it goes to an end user. And then if I put BPDU guard on there, it says, hey, if for some reason I start receiving BPDUs on this port, shut the port down. So in other words, if a bad guy comes into your office, unplugs your PC, and then plugs a switch into that port, now all of a sudden this, this switch port that was marked for an end user starts giving BPDUs because he wants to be, be part of spanning tree. I need to shut that port down because something's not right. So port fast, make the port come operational faster. BPDU guard, if I receive a BPDU on this port, um, I will shut the port down or I will put it in an error disabled state, same thing, shut down. But you get the idea. So make sure you understand what port fast does and what BPDU guard does. All right, load balancing. All right, I don't really know what they're trying to show on this slide other than you can set the root bridge for each VLAN manually and you can set them on different switches. So you can pri prioritize how data moves by each VLAN in your network if that makes sense. So in this case, the decisions for VLAN 10 are going to be made from S1's point of view, but the decisions for VLAN 20 are going to be from Switch 3's point of view. So he may go here and here, and then this guy may go here and here. Um, if you get the, so they won't use this link here at all because it's slower for both of them, if that helps. So again, they're setting that as primary, secondary, primary, secondary, um, and that way you're covered if somebody else switches that makes a, a different priority number. All right, so again, you can set by each VLAN the priority number, or you can set it by, you know, primary or secondary. Um, show spanning tree active, you know, what's my priority, what's my MAC address, oh, hey, this one's the root, um, that kind of stuff. These are then, they, obviously, these would all be designated ports. They would all be in the forwarding state. Um, the cost of these ports is 19. Uh, show running configuration, and if you look near, I want to say it's near the bottom, but I could be wrong. Um, your spanning tree stuff will pop in there. Hey, what modem I'm in per VLAN spanning tree, um, and then what the priority of the different VLANs are for this switch here. All right, so again, global. I go to global mode, spanning tree mode, um, rapid per VLAN spanning tree. Enter. Um, I can set the interface type. Um, so I go to interface fast Ethernet 02, spanning tree link type point to point, and um, or I can clear spanning tree detected protocols, new things like that. So really, the the two biggest commands you need to remember are obviously the the spanning tree mode rapid P PVST if they want rapid per view and spanning tree on, and then using the primary and secondary mode to set your own root bridge. Otherwise, you could just set the priority like that. All right, so again, they're just going to talk about some stuff here on spanning tree. Hey, show spanning tree, um, show spanning tree VLAN. Blah, blah. So uh, I probably should have got rid of that slide. Now, expected topology versus actual topology. You know, when we look at the actual topology, it looks like this. Um, but when they're saying expected is, hey, if this is the root bridge for VLAN 100, um, I, I get to this network this way, I get to this network this way, and I get to this network this way. So if, if there's a network on S1, I go there. If there's a network on S3 or S4, I go there. But it, these are the two that get shut off. So the expected topology is, hey, these are disabled ports. Um, so I will never go from S1 to S3 to get to S3's network. I'll always use this connection. Now, don't forget, if for some reason this link here goes down, 
spanning tree will talk to S1 and S3, and they will bring this link back up using BPDUs, because remember, it's disabled, which means it's listening for BPDUs to tell it when to come back up. Uh, and then I would send here and here. Um, and again, all that stuff happens rather pretty fast, um, so most of the time the end user doesn't even know what happened. All right, so I can also show spanning tree by the different VLANs. So show spanning tree VLAN 100. Um, here's my priority. Now notice this is on S1. S1 is not the root bridge, so it's telling you it doesn't give you that this is the root bridge, bridge message. Um, it just shows you, hey, here's my priority, here's my um, address, and if I'm not the root bridge, um, you, you can kind of have to go through the other ones to figure out which one is. But you can notice that his interface 91 is a root port. So if that one points to S2, then that's kind of how you would know, okay, then S2 must be the root bridge. So designated ports, which ones are active, uh, and then root port, which points to the root bridge. All right, if for some reason a user does uh, something bad and configures spanning tree wrong, or for some reason if spanning tree just fails to do what it needs to do, um, and this let's say this link here comes back up, now we've got a loop again, and we can loop stuff, and then frames can enter, and then blah, they go forever. So remember, there is no mechanism to kill a layer two frame. All right, so repairing a spanning tree problem, one way to correct a spanning tree problem is to manually remove redundant links. So you go into your network and you start pulling cables. Um, I don't think that's the, well, I guess if you got a loop and you can't stop it, um, that's probably the best way. And then again, before restoring the redundant links, determine what caused the problem. You know, hey, before I put these links back in, I don't want to cause another loop. You know, I need to figure out what caused the problem. What was wrong with spanning tree? Was it a configuration issue, or did something come up or come down that, that wasn't supposed to? Um, and then obviously, you want to, once you plug those links in, carefully monitor your network. Hooray! All right, now first hop redundancy protocols are not covered on the CCNA, but again, we just we introduced them here. All right. First hop redundancy protocols are to allow us to have multiple default gateways in use, and that way if a link dies or a router dies, um, we've got multiple paths to get where we need to go. So in an instance like this, you know, let's say I've got um, internet from three different ISPs, or I just have three internet from one ISP, but I've got three routers all here waiting to go. So what happens is we typically give out a, a virtual IP address. And all these routers will respond to the virtual IP address and then they will forward excuse me to the forwarding router and then he'll send stuff out and that way if the forwarding router dies the standby router takes over and the virtual router passes to the this would then become the forwarding router and then he would pass stuff out just like in the diagram so that's the idea behind that typically companies have two internet connections coming in from two different ISPs and that way if Time Warner takes a dump you know your AT&T link will still be up and then your stuff all switches over you know needlessly or seamlessly and you're right back in the game so the two big ones well I say two big ones the two normal ones are the hot standby router protocol we've always called the hot swap router protocol and that is Cisco proprietary and then there's virtual router redundancy protocol or VRRP um, and that is an open source standard now the problem with those two is they only allow one router to be used so typically there's a standby router and then there's a primary router and everything is forward to the primary and you only use the primary and then if the primary dies the secondary kicks in so if you've got two routers only one is being used so that's kind of a shortcoming so Cisco has then invented the gateway load balancing protocol GLBP again Cisco proprietary and there's also a version for IP6 but what GLBP does is allows all those different um, routers to be used and then if one dies you know it just kind of limits the thing but it uses like a virtual IP address that's on all the routers and then that way as data comes in the router with the lowest load you know takes that packet and sends it out to the internet so with hot swap routing protocol and VRRP um, this is kind of what you see everybody kind of sends here um, and then it goes to the active one and the standby one just sits there and doesn't do anything um, but then if the active dies the standby is used all right and then if you type in you go and show standby from privilege mode you'll see you know what's the, what's the state what the virtual IP address is um, where, where the standby router is what his priority is um, what the group name is things like that 
All right, with GLBP, remember all the routers are working together in a load balancing state. So you can have four routers going out to the internet and all load balancing the, the, the internet traffic. Um, so again, you can see they create a virtual IP address and they will all respond to the virtual IP address, um, which is nice. So GLBP obviously um, needs, requires a little bit more configuration, uh, but it's nicer because you can use all your routers that are connected to the internet um, for load balancing. All right. So, yay, almost done here. It's only been 45 minutes, and you've lasted this long. I sure hope you've got a beer or two. All right, so remember, um, IEEE 802.1D is simply spanning tree protocol. Um, spanning tree protocol comes in multiple flavors. We have rapid spanning tree. We have rapid per VWAN spanning tree, which is what Cisco supports. Um, and then we have our, per, or our first hop redundancy protocols, HSRP, um, VRRP, and GLPB. A lot of letters. Too many letters for me to say. But you get the idea. So again, don't forget, if you have any questions on how the root is elected, um, what command turns things on, um, that kind of stuff, please bring them to class um, and ask me before the lab starts. All right, guys, I'll see you in class.